What's up, peers, and welcome to Join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Today, I'm enthralled to sit down with my good friend, Nico Omnifin. Uh, he is a prolific contributor to Bitcoin uh, in numerous ways. We actually started our Bitcoin rabbit hole journey uh, very early on together and have been tinkering on different free software projects uh, together in, in tandem. Uh, and independently on our own, but always stayed in touch. Uh, so he's not just a great philosopher, uh, but also a good friend. And I'm really eager to have today's conversation about uh, the aspect or the concept of a starfish versus a spider organization. And this is based on a, a great book. And Nico has digested and really internalized this concept and is living it out in his actual uh, life on numerous occasions, for example, with his book publishing house, uh, Consensus, where he uh, translates and publishes great Bitcoin resources, mainly books, in numerous different languages. And he uses a, a, this very interesting free software approach to manage and operate uh, that venture. And today we will look into how these decentralized methods of organizing can be used, uh, especially for creating privacy preserving technology as censorship of the service providers of self sovereign tools is inevitable. And therefore we need to find ways to have censorship resistant ways of gathering and working together. Uh, and of course, as always, this is a community funded and sponsored support. So if you like this content, Toss us some sats with a value for value enabled new podcasting app.com like Breeze Technology. Uh, and this goes to all the amazing contributors, not just me, but to Saxonet, the editor, uh, and to Nubuntu for the show notes and to Jaeger for the amazing artwork. But Pierce, without any further ado, let's get into our conversation with Nico. How are you, my friend? Hey, Max, it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for the nice, nice words in the intro. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you hear your ideas about the, the world and the second realm and privacy. And these are all more important topics than ever with the, with the world we're living in and, uh, yeah, eager to get into it. Yes. And a, a lot of our shared backstory is recorded going back well over a happening. So Pierce, if you want to get more background on Nico in general, go back in the archives, you will find it. But for, for those who don't yet know you. Uh, give us a big, uh, bit of your background in why are you so motivated to do the work that you're doing in the free software space? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I actually, I'm a construction engineer by trade. I made a whole career out of it and pretty much lived like anybody else. Um, just, you know, the normal, normal people going to work, paying taxes, you know, spending money on booze and, you know, elaborate like this, uh, trips and basically it was pissing my, my life away and, and working as a slave. And despite of ha having heard of Bitcoin in 2010 from my mother, which was, uh, uh, another a fun story. Um, I was always technology, technology nerd and, you know, I, I was running the client and, and, you know, testing it, but then I was also at the same time trying to graduate from my uh, second formal degree and, and continue my uh, construction engineering career. And I made the mistake of not listening to myself, but to listen to everybody else around me who told me, you know, like stop playing with stupid, stupid, uh, you know, internet weird things and be a man and get a job. And I listened to them. I did Bitcoin for many years and every now and then I would, I, I, my mind would go back to it. And, but I never really d dug into it until 2017, I think when I finally, um, for one reason or not, another read the actual white paper. And that just kind of blew me away because I've been really depressed for a long time for the state of the world. And that's probably one of the reasons why, 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 that contributed, um, for me to comply like a good little boy and, and, you know, get a nice job and, and, you know, start, start to get all those nice things, apartments and cars and, and, uh, long, long trips to the bar. 
because I was lost. Like I'm, I'm gonna be completely honest. I was, I was lost with myself. I saw, I felt that not everything is right with the world. I just didn't see how there could ever be anything to fix it. So I was just like, you know, fuck it. I'm just going to live it out and I'm going to burn out rather than fade away or this kind of attitude, which probably many of you listeners are familiar with. Until... Quite nihilistic. Sorry? Quite nihilistic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the word. Yeah, I was very nihilistic and I, I didn't really like I was it, nothing felt like anything and uh, everything was a joke. Beauty was a joke. Love was a joke. Everything was a was was just uh, for entertainment and you know quick dopamine spikes and yeah I, I I'm sure many can relate to this I've heard this story from so many Bitcoiners. However, once I read the Bitcoin white paper and I I realized that there is a way and th and this is by the way something confirmed also in, in this awesome book by Eric Voskul, the crypto economics, uh, you know the uh, resist uh, the axiom of resistance. I didn't realize I didn't understand. Uh, despite of my time being in the computer world and in, into all this nerdy shit, um, I didn't understand that there's systems that cannot be touched by anybody, that cannot be broken by anybody, and that the system can be money, that it can be unconfiscatable. And that's just kind of, it just completely blew me away. And I, I just couldn't do anything at all. Like I, I barely ate, I barely slept. I just, uh, for months and months, consumed every podcast, every article I could find. And that's around the time, uh, a couple months after that, actually, when we, we first met probably, um, in 2000, uh, in the end of 2017, I believe. Yeah, this, so. this is quite fascinating, right? So a, based on, on the many problems of, of the current situation, uh, and not finding a possible solution to that, right? Not being creative enough to think of a potential that is, or, or, or to find a way to a better world, right? That if you don't have that vision, that creativity, well, then you, then you lack aim and purpose, uh, and, and means of getting there. And that's a, a very depressing thought, right? But then when, when Bitcoin comes along, all of a sudden this genius Satoshi comes up with a cool new idea that actually solves a massive problem and that all of a sudden makes it actually tenable and, and possible to reach that better potential of the future. And that's a much more hopeful and, and positive outlook. Right. And, you know, I, I totally sympathize with uh, all the no, no coiners and there's a, a lot of smart ones too. Um, you know, I was, I was one and, and it is really difficult to when, especially the older you get, like I was already. I, th I think I was already past 30 when I, when I really understood, uh, started to understand and fall down the, the Bitcoin rabbit hole. The older you get, the more you are invested in the status quo and the harder it becomes to unplug from the matrix. Like somebody said in Twitter, you know, after a certain age, it becomes impossible to unplug from the matrix. And not, I don't think uh, quite, quite that drastically, but it is, there is some truth to that because you, you tend to invest in your career. Uh, maybe you, you have a house, you have mortgage, you have a fancy car, you have expenses and you, you can't really, you know, it's, it's very inconvenient. Let's say, let's put it this way. Like it's very inconvenient to unplug from the matrix, no matter the, um, possible, uh, rewards that would come from that. And also that goes back to the nihilism, which is like, everything is a joke. Okay. So this is another joke. This is like, I, I told myself for years, like, uh, this is just you you know funny funny money on the internet maybe you can you know make make some quick quick fiat gains with that if you get lucky but you know i'm i'm probably too late already i don't want to lose any any of my precious fiat um you know ex exploring this kind of thing so i understand and i think a lot of people are in in, in that uh, particular hole and I, I i guess you need to get out from the fiat hole and go into the bitcoin rabbit hole uh, which has been for me the probably the most fulfilling thing uh, in my personal life that 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 I've I've explored, and it, it has given my life a whole other meaning. And you know, I'm doing way better now. Like obviously, we are still affected affected by all the propaganda and all of our history, 
and it's a it's a daily struggle to kick some old bad habits but at least at least bitcoin provides the option now yes and as you say when you want to plug out of the matrix it is pretty inconvenient and another way of framing that is that it is quite costly right there you have a perceived high opportunity cost of giving away your precious fiat right and, and risking that um and i guess the the cypherpunk's answer to that is to write code so to build better technology that reduces the cost of unplugging out of the fiat matrix and emerging as a sovereign individual yeah yeah absolutely you know the the, the thought that you could take care of yourself and not listen to the experts <laughs> you know that's a that's also an inconvenient thought because uh it and it includes responsibility of yourself which many many people are willing not willing to t take like if anything goes wrong like I, I used to be like this whenever something would go not not go my way i would look for somebody to blame you know other than the man in the mirror right and and I think I think this is very typical for the modern society where the state has taken the role of God and in in the state we trust and not ourselves. So it's it's a struggle, it's an uphill battle to start retrusting yourself because that is the basic state that we are all born into, uh, complete freedom and self-ownership and self-responsibility as well. Uh, but as as soon as we we enter the the fiat world, the fiat education institutions uh, specifically, it kind of starts to put you down and, you know, this, in these subtle ways, like, are you doing this wrong? You know, th there's a study that, you know, you've been doing this wrong all the time. Like, you should listen to the expert because they clearly know what's good for you better than you yourself. And people are really, really uh, into this kind of a cult, which is, which is kind of depressing. Yeah, this this is the attempt to remove yourself from the consequences of action and from the responsibility that that carries. Well, but that's impossible simply by the fact that you're a human being that acts and that therefore has to live with the consequences of their action. It's it's the defining part of being human. Right? So you you cannot live without responsibility. And then once you understand that, this also means so so basically responsibility is in a sense knowing what to do and what not to do and living by that so this is basically the the assumption right that you can remove yourself from responsibility uh, but that's kind of impossible just because you as a human are being defined by individual action and action means that you have to live with the consequences of action uh, whenever you change uh, the, your surrounding and the material world right? there's no way going back in time so i i wonder that then this this really means that the individual is well responsible for his actions and that he, this means he has the both the possibility of doing good things and prosperous things as well as being destructive and and parasitic um and that is ultimately up to the individual uh and that is the burden of of responsibility as well right to know that you yourself have the capability of doing bad things that are counter to what you actually want to achieve and if you do them, then there's nobody else to blame but you. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you can hide from the responsibility, but that doesn't take it away. Like if you think about every single major human calamity in the human history, it has happened because of people chose to hide. They, they chose to let it happen uh, to their communities. They chose to listen to the experts. They chose to outsource the responsibility to violent regimes of, you know, violence monopolies they chose that and yet they hide from that and then later they were just like oh well you know we didn't know but you kind of did know like you, there's no there's no turning away from that so i i think this is very important that people realize that for example what is happening now in the world you know it's exactly the same that has always been you know you know listen listen to the experts all, all the calamities have been backed by the experts all the calamities have been backed by um law-abiding, tax-paying, good citizens. And everybody thinks they are good. You know, everybody thinks they are the good guy, especially the, uh, the normal people and who, who are not self-thinkers, who are not self-sovereigns, who are, who are not un unwilling to carry the responsibility. Those, so they outsource it to somebody. And the downside of outsourcing the responsibility, outsourcing the uh, 
um, uh, responsibility of your actions is that you still have to act. And in the end, you will still have to pay the bill uh, as, a, as a collective uh, human society. So there's, there's no turning away from your actions. Exactly. Everyone is a sovereign individual, but not everyone is a good sovereign individual that actually does a good job at being that. So yeah, yeah to, just to add to that, you know, like, I, I think one of the big problems is that people think that uh, we can somehow remove evil from the world by laws and, you know, restrictions and jailing people and using violence on people, you know, basically removing evil with more evil, you know, fighting fascism with fascism. And yeah, it's, it's like uh, fighting fire with fire, really. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really is. And so I, I wonder, because we basically assume here, right, that it's at the individual's position to do good or bad, right? That's, that's individual choice, and it's your responsibility to live with the consequences of that. And if, if you have that type of an outlook, right, then relying on a system that is secured by only one individual is extremely risky, because that individual can be easily or can easily go down a wrong path uh, where he either breaks his word or uh, breaks contracts or steals from others or uh, does trouble in any sort of way, right? As if there's one individual responsible for holding up the entire operation of the venture, then this is a central point of failure. And since humans are well, flawed to, to a great extent and do have that capacity to do evil, that centralized approach is inherently vulnerable to just the eternal um, existency or, or aspect of, of human existence. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the example of Australia, um, you know, things work rather well while they worked, but now it seems like, well, there's no bill of rights. There's no uh, recourse for the people if the state decides to do something they don't like. So that's, I, I think that's a perfect example of how a system can fail by, you know, turning against its uh, su subjects and, and we are subjects, you know, the, for the state, we, we are treated like cattle and some states are obviously better actors than others, but nonetheless, the, the whole point of a state is the same to pump value from the cattle and, you know, being a sovereign means that you provide as a sovereign uh, with your actions value to other sovereigns who then uh, voluntarily uh, give you resources that you can use to live. And, and this is the world that I think we are going to see uh, in, in some timeline. But before, before we go there, I, I, I think uh, we're going to see it get a little bit worse uh, before that, but I, I think the writing is on the wall. We have we have internet, we have Bitcoin, we have uh, all these you know starfish organizations, and um, you know the state as a quintess quintessential uh, spider organization is not going to. I think I, it cannot survive. Yeah, that's a great point. That a centralized system, a spider system, so to say, or a spider organism with a central point of failure, it works great if it is not under attack. Right? Because due to its centralization, it's inherently uh, faster in decision making and adapting to changes, and um, that's the, and latency also. Uh, so that that makes it very quick to to change and to adapt, as long as it is not under attack. But the problem is that if it is under attack, then there is a high likelihood that one out of one party gets taken out. And that leads to the instant collapse of the system. So decentralized systems are great for short-term uh, agile movement, but for long-term survival against serious attacks, they are really not well suited. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, a good example of a spider organization doing its job well is a, is a functional service provider that provides centralized service to people who willingly want to buy it and they are responsible on the free market for their actions to the customer base. So if they mess up, the customers will go somewhere else. Now, where it gets tricky is when we have state monopolies that don't have competition. And I'm sure everybody would agree that the local post offices are, are a prime example of this. Uh, having been shipping books all around the world for the past three years, I, I'm, it's like 
it's a nightmare. You know, like that's really, you don't feel like you are uh, the customer, the boss, as you should be. As you, you, you know, the entrepreneur should always be completely accountable to the customer. And if not, then the customer has the choice to go to somebody else who provides a better service. And this is the, you know, the basis of free market and how, how it should work. And state impedes that, state prevents that from happening uh, in lieu of, um, you know, mon kind of like these monopolies and oligopolies uh, that channel funds from the before said cattle uh, to another pockets that are usually not in the service of the customer. It has nothing to do with customer service. If, if you have ever tried to get anything done with a state official, I'm sure you would agree with that statement. Yes, of course, very much. So, you know, this is the, the crux of the issue that centralized systems are great at expanding quickly and providing services uh, reliably as long as they're not under attack. But then once they're under attack, they get killed very quickly. And that means that a lot of centralized services go out of the market either by overt attack or just by not being profitable. Um, but in any case, it Therefore, it is required to have a free market where new centralized organizations can pop up to provide a similar or different service uh, to satisfy these consumer demands. Right? If, if that entrance of new participants is prohibited, especially when we're talking about spiderfish organizations, uh, spiderfish, <laughs> about spider organizations, right? centralized organizations, uh, that means that ultimately we 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 suffer a lot right because these systems tend to die and there is no new system replenishing them uh, which is an inherent centralization risk even more so right exactly and and this is why it's so important that people become sovereign sovereigns and find uh, their own network of uh, other sovereigns and sovereign companies also you can be a sovereign company that does have a moral code and and do, does not screw over their clients and if they're under attack uh, maybe they will just, you know, change to a different jurisdiction or, or you know, quit instead of being corrupt by this kind of a state attack. Like, I can't tell you how appalled I am to see, you know, for example, many, um, you know, Finnish exchanges. Basically, we don't have any any uh, good exchanges in Finland anymore. They bend, bend the knee uh, to the state, which means that they become an act, a, a attacker. There's, there's no good way uh, for Finnish people to acquire uh, Bitcoin anymore because the spider organizations have been corrupted. And, and yeah, this is what happens. Uh, and of course, the free market is impeded by these ridiculous, uh, uh, these ridiculous regulations that make you compile to the extent that your business model practically becomes unsustainable and you cannot compete. So the only way is to negotiate with the terrorists and do what they say, and then, you know, sell this idea to your customers uh, that, you know, if we don't do this, we can't provide you the service. Well, fuck that. Then don't provide the service or change <laughs> jurisdictions. Like, that's not an excuse. I'm not going to accept that. That's that's terrible. And, and a lot of people are like, no, 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 like, you, you know, um, they're not trying their best. And, you know, you can do so much better. Like, I don't want to provide a service. I don't want to provide a lackluster service or dangerous service to anybody. I, I, I'd rather not provide it and, and find something else to do with my time. Yes. And this is, again, the inherent danger of centralized systems that not just can they be shut down or prevented from entering, they can be co-opted and manipulated right? so that they do provide a service, but it is very different to what free individuals would have chosen. This is a hallmark of fascism uh, upon others. Yeah, I agree. So let's let's look at alternatives to get to get around this system. Um, how how would you define then this alternative idea of the starfish organization? Right. So uh, starfish organizations are nothing new. It's basically uh, it goes as far back as you know tribal tribal cultures like my favorite example is the the amazon tribes where they had these uh, nantans that were basically ring ring leaders for for uh, decentralized you know tribe units and it was extremely difficult to eradicate them because if they would 
go about it as the normal way. You know, when you conquer a country, you you take the head of the king and take their gold, and you're pretty much done. Um, but that didn't work with them because they were moving fast. And, you know, if you killed one of the Nantans, another one would rise up from the ranks. And they were driven by uh, the idea of freedom, of being free men and doing whatever they want. And it's nothing new. It's it's uh, old idea, but uh, it's not as popular. I, I think it's most popular in maybe kind of like vol voluntary um, organizations uh, that... Uh, alcohol, Alcoholics Anon Anonymous is, is one example where basically the same idea works everywhere in the world and everybody does it because it benefits them because they have an issue and they want to talk about it together. And, you know, you don't really have to um, manage it in any kind of way because everybody's just doing it from, from their own need. And I, I think this is the crux here, like... In a Starfish organization, you don't really go and apply for a job. I, I don't think that's not uh, uh, what happened um, with with Consensus Network, which is, which is my publishing company, and we have volunteers. Like I don't I don't keep a list obvious for obvious reasons, uh, but I would I would say we have probably thirty to fifty volunteers working on on the books, and you know the company itself is just me basically, and, and my shitty laptop. Uh, that's the centralized point of failure as, as of now, but we already have so many people who, who have joined the ranks and not because they were like, hey, you know, give me a job and, you know, I, I want a salary and I want this and that uh, benefits. No, that, that's not how it works. How it works is that people want to do it. Like, I, for example, 2018, when I read the Cyphedian's Bitcoin standard, it blew me away. And... I, I realized I have to, I have to translate it to Finnish, my own language. And uh, there's a lot of people like this. There's a lot of people like I, I get weekly emails from people like this. And 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 you don't really have to do anything to motivate uh, a, a person who is hell bent on giving this information to their peers. Like you you don't have to do much. All you have to do is give uh, some guidelines, some. Uh, you know, resources, the experience that we accumulated, share all of that and, and you know, work together uh, rather than work for somebody. I don't want to tell anybody what to do. Uh, I don't want to command anybody. I don't want that kind of uh, responsibility. Um, you know, I, I'd rather just trust that the game theory plays out, that everybody is there for their own reasons, own completely selfish reasons, which usually is, uh, they want to want to educate their peers. They want to educate their family, their friends. Um, so, so that's that's their angle. Perhaps they want to, like myself, I, I want to raise information capital, this kind of like uh, status capital in uh, amongst uh, Bitcoiners by doing doing these things. It's it's all about myself. I do it all for myself, and I've never said any uh, anything else to anybody else. And I expect that same thing, same mindset for every. Uh, individual that uh, cho uh, cho chooses to uh, join us in this quest and yeah it's been working great so far like for example the uh, uh, a crazy project that, that the Dutch Bitcoin standard we have 15 translators working on the same book <laughs> like ants and uh, yeah I didn't I didn't you know obviously I don't even know the language I didn't have to do anything I just trusted that I have the I, I must have the best people because you know it was announced in the uh, Bitcoin Twitter, where where I always announce the projects where I uh, usually most of the Bitcoiners are, and uh, yeah, you know the game theory. It's kind of like a shelling point. Like you you can trust w without knowing. You're like I don't need to see your credentials. I don't care if if you are. Uh, you know, it's great if 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 you're a you know linguist or you have a degree or whatever. It's good for you. However, I don't care about that. I only care about results, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's been a really wonderful experience. And I, I'm actually quite, you know, I'm a little bit surprised how well it has actually worked. And I think the reason is that Bitcoiners are already in the same mindset. Like this would probably not work in most most fields. Uh, if, if I tried to translate any other kind of books with the same model, it would probably not work as well. Uh, because because Bitcoiners are already sovereign, free individuals. Uh, they do things because they want to do. They don't want, uh, generally, they don't want anybody to tell them what to do. 
and yeah, it, it's, it works great for me because I don't want to tell anybody what to do. Yeah, there's so much to unpack here. And the, the intrinsic motivation of, of Bitcoiners is, is truly relentless. And that's a, a wonder to behold, uh, honestly. Uh, one thread I would like to pull from your earlier rant is the, the aspect that uh, in a decentralized organization, uh, you each individual node mimics uh, the pattern uh, of of others uh, in a sense, right? You you share information uh, and not so you receive it and you act it out again. You you speak it to others, uh, and this is a very reciprocal uh, relationship, right? The, uh, uh, of both knowledge accumulation, uh, processing, and then then sharing knowledge sharing, right? It's it's the whole the whole deal: um, uh, thought, emotion, act, and action. Uh, it's and I that that makes it a very a very compelling system and i i wonder if the if the motivation is somehow part in in this great experience of helping or of sharing useful patterns with other individuals yeah absolutely like you know for example all of our books have gotten better because of all of the different projects because every single team comes up with a new suggestion and I, I just move it, move it. I have, I have this kind of like a folder structure, which has the basic instructions and, and everything, how to go about it. And whenever we find a, a, a better way to do it, it goes across the board. So it's kind of like propagating notes, really. Like, uh, I think that's not, I, I'm going to start using that. Um, it, it, it really is because uh, we all have the same information, the same all the books are made in a, in a very similar way. Of course, there's variation, but all the best ideas will be transported to the other teams. And at the moment, I'm, I, I think I'm running like around uh, 20 teams uh, of different books. And, and uh, you know, it, it's kind of like it's evolving by itself. You know, uh, I don't like, I don't plan it from a central location. Sure, I, I gave the first guidelines based on, but that was, again, that was based on our experience with the Finnish version of Bitcoin standard, which we didn't know what the hell we were doing at all. Like we were just like, yeah, yeah, you know, let's translate that book. It's probably easy, right? No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was not easy at all, but we learned a lot. And then uh, I, I realized very quickly that there's a lot of demand for this and it can be replicated, the work, the hard work with it, like all the, you know, for example, I vectorized all the figures. Well, now I can use the same figures in every single language. All I have to do is change the, you know, the text. And that's what, just one example. Uh, but yeah, it goes goes across the board and it just keeps getting better and better. And, and the people are so damn motivated. It's, it's really a beautiful sight to behold. Yes. And this, again, this intrinsic motivation of deeming for yourself that this tool is useful, right? This pattern is useful. When you understand that because it has solved a problem for yourself, then you're not just encouraged to share the same pattern with others, but to improve the quality of the pattern, right? So, so that the tool does more adequately solve the problem that you wanted to solve. And that's the scratch your own itch ethos in free software development, right? You use a software, it's helpful, right? It, it, it solves a problem for you, but it doesn't do so perfectly. Right? You you can think of a way to make it even better than that. Also, you write the code, make a pull request, and it gets merged, right? It's it's being shared with everyone who is using that software. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's also uh, privacy-wise, it's great because, you know, we don't need names. We... <laughs> We, we barely need the name tags so that we, we know who we're talking with. But the, even that is not completely necessary. And, you know, it's, I, I think it's a wonderful way. And I think it's the future way that we're going to more like a pseudonymous kind of a world where it doesn't really matter who you are, which school you went to, uh, who you know, who are your friends, what's your name, what do you look like, all irrelevant information all that is relevant is the work proof of work exactly and the reason why identity is not is is not needed is because identity is an easy solution to the spam problem right if you have a lot of unwanted communications being sent to you uh, then you introduce an identity system and as soon as one person sends you way too much information you just stop listening to that one person Right? And you can enforce it because you know everyone on the network. 
right? So censorship becomes very easy when you have identity. And that means that the spam problem is solved because you can just censor the spammer, right? But that kind of only means that you only need to apply identity if you actually have a spam problem, right? And in, for example, a system like Bitcoin, uh, where we use proof, the, the, the regular hash, uh, you know, hash function proof of work, um, uh, that introduces a, a verifiable cost. You know, you 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 cannot fake uh, the the production of a of a new hash below a difficulty target that needs to be computed at random multiple times, uh, and therefore you can easily or. And that's why the an the anonymous Bitcoin network works because there is proof of work that anonymous parties need to provide in order to be recognized as a valid person to talk to. But, but in your example of book publishing, it's a very similar thing, right? Um, it, it's not free for people to to write you a message, basically, right? They they do need to like in order to get your actual attention, they need to provide at least some minimal value. Right? And if they just send you literal spam emails, it's pretty easy nowadays to just filter them out and to ignore even multiple persons who, who do that. But in any case, at, at a small enough scale, this is really not a problem at all. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you didn't really have a problem of, of a person submitting a whole bunch of translations that were just horrible and the person not stopping to do so, right? Because that's that it doesn't really make sense. A rational actor wouldn't really do that. Yeah, of course. Uh, like, what would what would they gain from that? Like, you know, sure, you can try to, I guess, sabotage. But then again, you know, we we have those other team members who will catch it. Who will? And and by the way, there has been has been uh, concerns with quality with some translators, and that's fine. You know, like everybody has their own way. Point is that these will be just much like open software. They will be caught. They will be caught and they will be dealt with and the end quality uh, will be ensured that is uh, it's top notch and and you know i use something that is called fresh eyes which is that i have another confirmation round from you know fresh eyes from 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 the twitter and who will who will still even if the whole team would be corrupt i i, I still have this kind of like extra layer of you know confirmation that I can have a reassurance because you know my biggest problem is that obviously I don't know most of the languages. I only know English and Finnish. So I, I cannot ensure that the quality is good, but I can trust um, this kind of like network of different individual nodes or if you will, um, that, that will do that confirmation for me. And uh, because of the of the incentive model in play here, I can trust it just like I can trust Bitcoin without understanding a single line of the code, which I don't. Uh, you know, most of it is just. Comp it, it, I might as well, well be reading Hebrew. Um, <laughs> you know, but I can still trust it because of the incentive model and the game theory. And uh, you know, going back to the. Uh, anti-fragility aspect that you brought out you know that's that's one uh, big characteristic of of a starfish organization and and just like you know uh, I, I i like to say that bitcoin is actually the quintessential starfish organization quite the opposite to the state which is the spider organization because not only it it is resilient to attacks it actually thrives in in a in an environment that is attacking you and is hostile to you it gets stronger and stronger and th and, and and this is the uh, uh strength of a starfish organization like if you if you know about the biology of a starfish what happens if you cut a starfish in half uh, then soon you will have two starfish to deal with and the same is with bitcoiners like it might seem that you know we are a centralized bunch when you go to bitcoin twitter and you know you see a bunch of these uh uh, Bitcoin cockroaches eating the central bankster's body, a uh, dead body. And uh, when, but once you uh, shine a light on them, they will just scatter and go between the walls and multiply. And you cannot eradicate them. You you will never eradicate uh, the Bitcoiners. And and this is the this is the strength um, of a starfish organization. It is it is not always the fastest and most efficient way to get where you want to go. You might sometimes want to use a spider organization. But if you want something completely ensured that it will be done, then 
I think you need a Starfish organization. You need the nodes, you need the sovereign individuals that provide uh, security for the network and continuity. And this is so similar to what actually Nopara lined out pretty early in the development of Wasabi Wallet. Pretty much as soon as he rebranded from Hidden Wallet to Wasabi Wallet, he opened a, a GitHub meta issue with the bus factor and how to make Nopara obsolete. Right? Because again, if, if the venture has a central point of failure and, and one person that has all the information in his head and is the only one that has the capacity to make decisions on how to move forward, and then even have the skill to implement the strategy that was decided about, right, which again involves a lot of decisions. Um, if, if that is all within one person, then the project is doomed to fail as soon as it is under attack. Uh, and uh, then the quest was to get more people involved, to, to educate them, to give them the, the knowledge that was in the head of Nopara only, and to replicate that pattern uh, into a distributed network uh, of multiple contributors who are all somewhat smart about the project uh, and then go and implement all the things that still need to be done. And all of a sudden, it's no longer a single person that if that person dies, uh, the whole project goes under. Uh, it's now a group of people, right? A, a distributed network, a starfish organization. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, you know, for me, like I said, I'm, I'm the central point of failure in terms of like, I have a company, I have to have it because of the li licensing uh, restrictions and we still live in the fiat world. And, and sometimes you just need, uh, you still need that, that kind of like a bridge with the Bitcoin world and fiat world and I'm the bridge. Sure, you can burn the bridge down and, and I have no doubt that, uh, you know, there will be some kind of a hunt for, for uh, avid Bitcoiners. Uh, vocal Bitcoiners who spread the knowledge and operate with their uh, own face and name as such as myself. I'm aware of that. And, you know, if it will happen, it will happen. However, I, I am going to ensure that, you know, the, the books will keep flowing because everybody has a copy, just like everybody has a copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so every, every, every uh, translator, every team, they have a copy of the work and you cannot eradicate that. Sure, you can stop my company from working. You, you can put me to jail, but you cannot stop the signal. Yes, and there are numerous layers of defense here against different attacks, right? For one, in a decentralized system, if you cut off uh, one node in the network, um, there are still others that have the same information, right? So essentially nothing is lost. And further, new nodes can still easily enter the system because there are other nodes that can share the information. And as long as not all other nodes are compromised, a new node can still get the pattern uh, that is useful. Um, and it also means that once you divide a community, um, that the past history, at least, is still um, in uh, is still in on both sides of the split. Uh, and both sides can now independently continue working on top of that old state and find kind of different conclusions, right? After you split, you walk different paths. But as soon as two nodes um, start to again talk to each other of these two different groups, because they overcome the censorship of the, the divide and conquer, so to say, uh, then they can sync up and you know share their Git differential uh, with who has been working on what. And that again leads to a, a, a emergence of into, into one network, although of course there might be conflicts uh, and it will be difficult to resolve them. Uh, that's why Bitcoin proof of work is there. But the general idea uh, applies for general situations, not just for co deep technical computer protocols. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's all about the you know again the incentive models and and you know people are willing to put their put themselves on the line and take the risk of their actions and you know despite of something being banned or something being shunned by the normies just uh, take the personal risk and 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 do it anyway and i i think uh bitcoiners are most of them are like this at least who i consider true bitcoiners sure there's there's a bunch of plebs who who will just uh, gamble uh, to get some fiat gains, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm, I'm talking about sovereign individuals, which I realize it's it's a, a quite a small minority at the moment. But that's also why we are working on the information distribution, because that, that's, that's why I chose to devote my life and my time 
uh, to saturate the world with Bitcoin information because that is the crux here. That is the, the understanding um, understanding of the protocol, understanding the capabilities, understanding um, of, of the possible end game, that there is a solution that we don't have to keep complying with ridiculous orders of, of some uh, you know, faceless superiors who always uh, seem to know better uh, than ourselves what is good for us. And, you know, uh, we, we need uh, Bitcoin as a, it, it, it's a tool of, of self-defense, as, as you often speak also. And I think, you know, books are a great way to educate people because books are also difficult, especially physical books are very difficult to eradicate once they start to saturate the world. Uh, because, uh, you know, you can always print more and it's rather affordable to print books. So I, I think that's one way, one reason also why I'm mostly focused on the on the print books because it, it provides a certain kind of proof of work and and uh, resiliency even against um, some kind of uh, weird super calamity electronic calamity event where where all the power goes down. You still have the books and you you can use fire to read them just like in the old times. So I I think that's like you 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 just can't like freedom has never been killed in the human history and they are trying very hard right now and i don't think they're going to succeed they can make our lives difficult sure um for a while and they will but uh, we can't just decide to give in and we can't just be those uh compliant um you know comfortable followers these uh, law-abiding taxpayers just because it's convenient, just because it's so-called safe, like um, we can't sac sacrifice the sovereignty to gain some safety, which there's no guarantees for, by the way. Like it's it's like the animals in the in the zoo. Like are the are the lions really happy in the cage? You know, they are, they are completely safe from any kind of uh, predator. They have all the food they can eat. They have access to <clears throat> prob probably some some lion sex but do they really want to do that like when you're not free when you're jailed you know or are they more happy in in out in the nature where there's no absolutely no guarantees of getting food there's no guarantee of getting late there's no guarantee of being safe or being taken care of it's all you and you know i i think this this is where where most people stumble yeah great point uh and as you say, when you give in on principles and try to remove responsibility from yourself that is inherently yours, uh, well, it, it it can only lead to to long term bad consequences. And uh, if ultimately, you know, happiness is is uh, achieving, or if, if if a good life is achieving high goals, you know, so so aiming high and actually fulfilling that target. Uh, then, yeah, being locked up in a cage and being removed from any decision-making capacity, from any way to be creative and to think of a better future, and any uh, and not having any capability to act and actually manifest this future, yeah, that kind of turns you into no longer human. Yeah, exactly. That like, going back to you know my my origins and how I got into Bitcoin, like that's exactly the life I was living. I was a zombie. Like you know, I didn't enjoy anything. Like I, I had to buy stuff to feel something, you know, I, I, or I had to get drunk to shut down my brain, <laughs> to stop feeling something, stop feeling the pain. It, you know, it's, it's not a life for a human. Yeah, very much. So the starfish organization is, is not just, um, in accordance with the principles of sovereign individuals. Uh, I, I would argue it even helps them to thrive. Um, and maybe one uh, one further reason for this is that yes a centralized system is sometimes more efficient in doing it right but in an isolated centralized system is much less efficient than a group of people right so uh, and it's not really about actually it's not really about being centralized or decentralized it's more about delegating some decision making power to someone else right and you can do that both in a centralized system as well as in a decentralized system um, to, to delegate power to someone else 
which as soon as you do that, of course, because other people get to invest their brain power into solving those problems, you can focus your scarce attention onto solving other problems. Uh, and therefore, the total number of problems that will be solved will increase. And that's the beauty of division of labor. Um, but that only holds up if those two nodes end up communicating again to at least share the information, like the new technology that they've discovered right, to exchange patterns, but then also to exchange goods and services right, uh, as uh, scarce resources that can be used to further satisfy uh, desires and wants. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's crucial for the um, sustainability of a Starfish organization that there's also a compensational model and which uh, which also we have uh, in consensus network the basically roughly the the idea is that I, I call it kind of like a shared or light entrepreneurship or you know a starfish organization uh basically how it works is that i put in capital uh, the author puts in their work and the translations put in their sweat and if we if we uh make some money i can rec uh, recuperate all the costs of doing the business and then uh, we're going to be uh, splitting the profits of that. So, and, and you know, distributing uh, some sets for, for the volunteers. And th this is like, I like to talk about voluntarians rather than volunteers, because uh, oftentimes uh, when you talk about volunteers, people assume that it's an unpaid job that you just do for fun, uh, which is maybe um, a, a, a misconstruction. I, I, I think, um, you know, like it, it, it's not in conflict that if, if you want to, you know, do some good deeds for yourself and to make yourself feel better and make the world better. So you have you and your kids have a better place to live. It's completely self, self selfish as itself, but it's not in conf conflict with uh, you know Austrian um, this kind of entrepreneurial prin principles that you need to be uh, also paid or communicated the value of your work in well in this case satoshis. Uh, so I, I think this is uh, also crucial for the for the long longevity of the project so the uh, idea is roughly that once and and some books have already made profit and when once uh, all of them are making profit then everybody who worked on them will also uh, be eating from that table for a, a possibly a very long time and um I, I, I would also like to bring out the uh, other thing that we are developing uh which is the affiliate program uh, which is another way for participating uh, to the Starfish organization without actually doing any translation work or, or anything like that. All you have to do is share our link, you know, um, advertise the book books uh, to your peers. Uh, so when they use your code, they will get 10% off and you will get a cut from each and every sale uh, for shilling the link. And then, well, uh, we, we, we get a sale of the book that we wouldn't otherwise make. So it's a, it's a triple win situation. And uh, I'm really excited to see how uh, it's been on beta since last summer for a year, and it's going to come out of the beta uh, very soon, probably probably um, in a couple months. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how it's going to work out because we're going to have some like, it's going to be uh, uh, kind of like a game, basically a, a game that you play for very real rewards, Bitcoin rewards. So you will, you will uh, have something like quests that you can you can uh, make like an achievement, like sell a book to three different countries, uh, you get a bonus. Um, you know, sell ten copies of a single book, you get a bonus. Uh, there's a there's a bounty called Speed Runner. You know, sell sell ten books in twenty four hours, get a bonus. And these bonuses re rotate every uh, every month, so you can do them again and again. Uh, every month they will reset. And then the more you do those uh, bounties, the more you sell, it's easy for us to pay you because, you know, otherwise we wouldn't make that sale. So we, we already have the money from the customer and then we're just going to, we're just going to convert it to uh, sats and, uh, and pay you for that. And you can just, there's going to be a claim sats button on, on the, on the site. So you can just go there and, um, you know, empty your wallet anytime. So I'm, I'm really excited to see, and, uh, and, you know, I, as far as I know, it's the only Bitcoin only, uh, affiliate program, uh, that does this kind of gamification. Um, there's a, a bunch of other stuff, but I don't want to shill it too much yet. Uh, you know, it's not ready. 
uh, but it will be in a couple months. So I'm, I'm going to be really excited to see how it's going to work. And I think it's going to uh, be something that we're going to uh, pull out of a consensus network and make it uh, available as open source that anybody can use it in their shop. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And one overarching conclusion that, that I can draw from all of this is that not only is it important that you pay people, which is obvious, you know, uh, people need to you know, become profitable and, and, and grow and you can only grow from external input, you know, that, that you attract. So uh, you need to pay people, that's obvious. But it's also crucially important of how you pay the people. And in, in classical praxeological economics, we can, there are two different types, right? There, there's basically the, the capitalist, uh, and then there are, um, laborers, right? So the, the capitalist invests money upfront or he invests capital upfront, uh, and he hopes that in the future he will retrieve more capital um, in revenue from the project than he put into the cost of the initial investment, right? So when you, when you take out more capital of a venture after te temporally, after you've invested it, then you've been a profitable capitalist, but of course there's a risk here, right? So you're also an entrepreneur, you're allocating scarce resources, capital, uh, in an uncertain future. Uh, that's the trademark of an entrepreneur, right? But this notice that this is very, very different to being a laborer or an employee, right? Someone who gets paid upfront and who then does some work, right? That's, that is, that is different because you get paid just for doing the work. And regardless whether there are consumers down the end of the line that actually value your work, right? You're not tied to, to the profit incentive per se, um, at, at least not in the short run. Um, and that makes it very different, right? For one, you have less skin in the game, right? You, you don't have to invest your own capital upfront, uh, with potential uncertainty of, of not getting paid, you know, you get paid instantly and even before you start working. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if it is, if it's possible to have a, a scenario where you have exclusively only one type of, um, relationship so that there is a, a venture company or like a, a company that is only made out of capitalists and that only that have no employees whatsoever right so everyone gets paid after they provide the work and can sell it profitably to gain more capital right only then people get paid um uh, i'm i'm not sure if if that's in theory possible or if it's even useful where, where i'm certain that's not in theory possible is to have only employees right if you have only laborers that want to get paid upfront and with no uncertainty of, of future customer demands and potential profit, well, that's not possible, right? Because who's going to pay them if none of them, if everyone wants to get paid and nobody is willing to put up the money upfront, right? So an uh, organization pure out of um, uh, laborers or, or employees does not work. You need a capitalist. I can, I can, I can say that, uh, you know, in, in my company, there's not, there's not a single employee and I don't think there will ever be, uh, I don't think there's a need, uh, at the moment, there's no employees. I only pay for the work that brings in money because otherwise I don't have the money to pay up front. You know, I, I'm already putting a lot of, uh, capital in risk to put, purchase the, you know, putting up money up front to buy the licenses and make the print runs. Um, that's pr pretty much, uh, all I can do. So then I will rely on the, on the volunteers to do the work that I can then sell so I can pay them. And this is exactly how it works. You know, uh, it's only paid by results and it's not paid. I don't ever pay upfront. I only pay for results. I don't care how much time you used. I don't care if you used a month or you used one hour. Um, I pay according to the result, how much money did it bring in? and how much money I can, I can pay for that. And only in the situation, and this is a free market situation, only in the situation that both parties, the, the, the volunteer and myself, uh, think that we, we gain more from this transaction than we give only then it will happen. And it just keeps happening. You know, it's, it's, uh, 
it's wonderful really i'm you know my biggest issue with the day job like nine to five job is that it it kind of gives you the wrong incentive model you get accustomed to the to the monthly salary it's like heroin really like you you get addicted mm -hmm. to that and you will do you know it shifts from building it shifts from building services and products to uh, people it shifts to how can i keep my you know monthly injection flowing so you do the bare minimum you 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 start to you don't necessarily put your all your mind mind to making the work better you try to do as little as possible and still get paid and this is like anybody who's worked a nine to five job i, I i'm sure can attest to this i sure uh, you know when i when i was working i i did this you know, i'm not even ashamed to admit it um you know like why like it, it, it's a crazy proposition that you no matter how efficient or fast you are you still have to sit by a desk for for the for the same eight hours as everybody else uh who is probably worse at their job than you and if you work more well well guess what you will get more work but no more money uh in in a lot of situations of course um uh, some some uh, jobs can pay you overtime and stuff but that's not the point here the point is that uh you you will tooth and nail hold on to that monthly salary that pays your bills and your extra uh lifestyle that you are now accustomed to think that you cannot do without but if you have the like healthy fear of like the fear of lord or fear of you know poverty or whatever uh this is kind of a dr driving force um you know survival instinct like if i don't provide a service or a product that um people are willing to give their money for uh willingly then i do not deserve to get paid and yeah for me for a lot of people are not willing to do that because they are addicted to the to the monthly salary which comes without any any basically any needs and in a lot of countries like for example in finland the communist finland um, it's very difficult to get rid of this kind of like parasites that that will just pump value out of the company without bringing any any money in and i and i guarantee every single entrepreneur who knows their stuff they will always always hire somebody who will bring in more money than they consume that's just it would be silly not to right yeah absolutely that's uh, that's what it means to be profitable and 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 to thrive and you know there's there's also one one point here that if uh, how do i phrase this so if you have or there's an there's an inherent difference between uh, the capitalist and the laborer not just in the risk taking appetite but uh, or out of all of that you see that the employee has a higher time preference right he wants to get paid sooner rather than later while the capitalist is willing to get paid later and that is a sign of a lower time preference and i okay now that's a what I'm making now is a speculation, but I would guess that there are more people out there demonstrating a higher time preference right now rather than a lower time preference. Um, and, and therefore, there is a larger market of employees compared to, uh, on, uh, to capitalists and entrepreneurs. And then if you structure your starfish organization in a way that makes it not possible for a uh, low time uh, for high time preference employees uh, to enter into the project because well that's just not how it's built right then that means that you for one exclude a vast amount of people to be potentially like to potentially work on the project right this is a massive exclusion to structure yourself in a way that only capitalists uh, and entrepreneurs can come in um so that's a that's a downside but now the question is of course um for one do you still need to have such a massive amount of workforce, right? So it's a question of scale. Do you really need to get, need to get thousands of contributors into the project? If yes, then getting all of them as capitalists is going to be difficult, right? But if, especially at smaller scale, I think it is possible to still find a sufficient number of people who have a low enough time preference to fulfill these capitalist roles. And even better, Maybe you even want to have a very harsh curation in the quality of contributors and in certain key aspects, like having a low time preference or having a courageous attribute and that entrepreneurial creativity and, and spirit. All of these are character traits that 
in my opinion, make people who are good to work with and maybe to focus the the onboarding process and, and the structure of the organization in a way to attract exclusively or maybe only especially these types of people may lead to interesting results. Yeah, good, good points there, Max. Um, I would say that this, uh, at least in my company, which is a capi completely capitalistic company, I think it's the contrary of exclusion. I'm very inclusive. Like I welcome absolutely anybody. Like I have this motto that, you know, everybody can screw me over once. Um, so, you know, like the exclusion is more like a, a personal choice. Right. So I, I do have people sometimes who approach me and they, they are curious about the model. And once I explain it to them, they will just say, okay, that's not for me. And it's, it's cool. It's fine. Then they exclude themselves uh, from the system. They maybe, maybe they have a higher time preference or different expectation. And that's completely fine. Uh, however, I do welcome everybody who, who does have a low, low time preference. And, um, you know, uh, to the what, point that I, you I think, yeah. what, what, what I'm more saying is that the people, so you do limit, uh, based on the, on the, on the structure of the organization itself, right? You, you cannot come into the project if you want to get paid before you start working. Right? Oh yeah. In that sense. Yeah. For that's sure. the, that's the exclusion. And what I mean is that this means that the people who, who are allowed to come into the system because of the rules of the system, they inherently demonstrate a lower time preference than those people who choose not to come in because it does not provide them employee benefits. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And you know, that's, I mean, uh, and, and the cool thing is because you've set up your structure to prioritize uh, or, or, or to attract low time preference, courageous entrepreneurs, that means that you can be much more inclusive with the acceptance of existing contributions. Right, because already all the uh, all the, the high time preference fiat guys are are out there. They're no longer wanting to contribute, and what's left is high caliber people who then again provide a proof of work in forms of actual contributions that you can then assess for validity and usefulness. You know that's a great point. I, I didn't think of, think of it that way. It's, it is a great filter, and it it, it does make uh, my work quite easy because you know that there's clear guidelines. And it's kind of like, you know, of course, uh, I'm always open for suggestions, but it, it is basically take it or leave it because this is how it functions now. And, uh, I have been changing the model a lot throughout the way, but usually it's the people who do come in, who do have the low time preference, who are looking to do multiple projects with me in the future. So they have all the incentives. Uh, to make sure that everything is going to roll smoothly and, and it's going to be better and more profitable for everybody. So I have no reason to, um, you know, not include those kind of changes. So that's, in, that's interesting. And, and, you know, I wanted to go back to what you, what you say about the, you know, kind of like bloating the company or need, ha having to have a lot of employees. I think like that should build organic organically. Right. I mean, that's a, that's kind of like a high time preference act to try to accumulate too much workforce too fast, uh, because then you, you, you do have to like your, your filter starts, starts to leak and you do have to kind of make compromises that you're not willing to make. What, what now, like I'll give you an example. When, when we started, I was the one who, who was uh, day and night on the, on the laptop and sending emails to everybody and, you know, trying to, uh, talk about this thing and try to raise interest. And now the tables have turned so that I'm the one who is replying the emails, you know, all the time. I, sometimes I don't have time to reply during the same day because I have so many people who are interesting, uh, interested in, in contributing and, and sure, not everybody does eventually, but a lot of, a great number of them do because they already, once they approach me, they already kind of know what's up, uh, what's going on. And they, do, they, uh, you know, Bitcoiners, uh, as, as a group of people. It's the most, uh, you know, hardworking and honest and, you know, morally upright people that I ever come across. So, you know, it's always a pleasure to work with Bitcoiners and, and, you know, I would, I would say more, more often than not, when I get approached, we do actually execute the project and yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be in the position to actually work as the bridge and provide this service, not only to the people who read the, the final product, but actually provide this Starfish uh, organization service 
to fellow Bitcoiners so, so they can have a chance to contribute and I can help them do that. Yes. And there is such a, it's, yeah, especially in Bitcoin, right, where, where people tend to eventually understand how impactful and useful this technology is, this urge to help be part in making it even better and to applying it, it to, to problems is, is crazy. It's relentless. Right. So to, to harvest that and, and to encourage the, like the, the advanced, um, use or, 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 or to just be encouraging and provide people a pathway to contribute is usually all that is needed. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. So then let, let the, the game theory th take over. It, it is a, it is a shelling point of like-minded people, you know, a Starfish organization, uh, by default. Uh, so yeah, just, just let people find you. The, the toughest part was to make people aware that I, uh, you know, the company exists and what we're doing. And now I think we've, we've reached that kind of a pivotal point, uh, that people already know it's an established, uh, established operator in the Bitcoin scene. And we are publishing books in 10 different languages, which is, which is kind of crazy since we started 2019 with one language, which is a fringe language in Finland. And now we are basically doing all the major languages in Europe and then also a couple languages outside Europe. So it's, oh, it's that's, moving really fast. That's also very interesting, right? That when you started this whole crazy idea, uh, you applied it in a very niche market. Like nobody cares about Finland, let's be honest. Right? So it's, yeah. it's a tiny, it's, it's a tiny market <laughs> and, uh, not like, so many critics would have told you, oh, it doesn't make even sense to focus your centralized time on doing this project in one location, right? But your intention, maybe not explicitly, but I guess your intention was not to keep this limited in just one region, but you recognize that what you're building is not a centralized solution in one small market. What you're building is a pattern of how to create a organism, a organization that creates great translations of Bitcoin focused content. And once you figured out that you can apply it at, at scale and copy the pattern away from a centralized idea that you had it into this decentralized network and live out the, the much, or the very censorship resistant and, and creative, um, no, prospects of that, right? As you say, it's, it's turning really uh, productive now, and it could not have been product, uh, uh, profitable if you would have stayed in an, in a centralized market in Finland, right? It, it could only grow to the size that it, it actually becomes profitable by expanding to a larger network and doing that, not just by growing the centralized system, but by turning it into a decentralized organism. Exactly. That, that was the plan all along. Like, sure. Uh, when we started the, the main reason for consensus network was just to get the Finnish book out. I, of course, was hoping that it will turn into a, a bigger thing. That's why it's called consensus network. And you, you were there uh, for the beginnings before it was even a company. If you remember, we had this telegram Pretty group much. called, uh, consensus network main office or something like that. At that time, we were focusing more, more on like, um, you know, inform informative, uh, YouTube shows and stuff like that. But the point was always, you know, global education. That was the point. And then we had this, you know, idea about consensus Academy, which is still, uh, somewhere in my brain. Uh, I, I often <laughs> think about that, but it, anyway, you, you remember how it was. And then, you know, this was just the catalyst that I needed. Uh, you know, I needed to prove it to myself that this can work and what better way to prove it than a niche market with a niche topic. If I can make it work in Finland. I can work, make it work pretty much anywhere. <laughs> you know, let's be yeah. honest. It's it's such a small market, and and sure, there's a lot of tech enthusiasts in Finland. Uh, that that's granted, but then you know the the market is still re really thin. But as, as you said correctly, like I, there was no way I was ever going to be profitable uh, if I stayed in Finland only. So so obviously I had to expand as soon as possible. We started with Portugal, and then we uh, mo moved to Netherlands, and uh, we also sell a lot of books in Brazil. We have two different versions of the Bitcoin standard, uh, in Portuguese. And now we have some other French languages. Like I, I am covering almost all of the Nordics right now. Um, we're still negotiating about the Nor Norwegian rights, but, uh, you know, um, I, I have Danish, I, I, I have Swedish, um, 
the Finnish, obviously. Then I have Albanian, which is uh, an, an interesting exotic language. Um, uh, we're going to have uh, Hebrew, uh, Czech, uh, off the top of my head. Uh, can't remember all of those, but yeah, we, we have a lot of, lot of titles coming, not just Bitcoin Standard, other books too, and for other authors, which is really nice to see uh, that the authors are finding us and they are finding our service useful. And obviously they are in the same boat. They want to spread the knowledge. That's why they write, wrote the book. And it's in their best interest, obviously, to have it read by as many people as possible. And to do that, you know, like it or not, most people do not understand English at, at such a level that they can study, you know, this kind of high, uh, you know, high-minded topic. So it is useful to still have, um, you know, localized it to your own language. And, and this is basically the, the whole idea uh, of the consensus network. And it's, it is becoming a, a network and, you know, if any, any, anybody's listening and wants to, wants to help, help is needed. <laughs> I'll, I'll assure you that uh, distributing books globally is a challenge, especially nowadays, and especially when you have to work with uh, with the state state is uh, mail offices. It, it's a lot of work. So you know, I, I just want you can you can just PM uh, m message me on Twitter or message me on Telegram or email me. I'll, I'll take any, any, uh, suggestions, how to make it more efficient and better, uh, because it's, uh, to be honest, it's starting to be uh, a little bit much for me to handle alone. You see, we, we for sure need a Lysander Spooner of our time. Uh, there was a great anarchist who in the, I think the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, provided a black market alternative to the centralized monopoly of state run postal services. Uh, and he was uh, a long, long in that fight with uh, trying to provide a better service despite government regulation and them literally trying to chase him away and, and killing his, his employees. Um, uh, it, quite drastic, but nevertheless, he kept on providing that superior service for numerous years. So in any case, one of the other things that we still have to solve, and most likely we're going to solve it with a, star, with a starfish organization, is a censorship resistant physical postal service in Meatspace. Uh, so maybe Nico, that's, that's one of our next projects then. Yeah, actually, um, uh, yeah, I have something, it's called the Liberty Press. Uh, I, I've already established in, in uh, two countries that I'm not going to disclose, but yeah, it's, it is a work in progress. And you know, if you wanna help build uh, the most uh, resilient and robust information distribution network, when it comes to um, physical books, you know, do contact me. I, I need a lot of help because it's it's really difficult, and especially with with, with the language barriers. So, I, I need some locals in, in my team to do that. Just the distribution uh, that that's the, at the moment is the biggest problem that we the biggest bottleneck that we have for expansion. Yes, and I think here we really see a, um, a flaw or, or a a difficulty in in our system here because. In order for the decentralized organism to become useful, it needs to be large enough, right? That's the network effect to it. And it is only censorship resistant, or it is most efficiently censorship resistant if it is completely anonymous, right? And if contributions are not tied to identities and therefore identities cannot be censored and shut down. Um, that of course introduces the whole spam problem and we can kind of solve that with human proof of work. Um, but the downside is that when we are in this complete anonymous setting where we are most optimally censorship resistant, then how do we build reputation and how do we pr uh, handle public announcements and advertisements so to find the attention of peers and to gain their anonymous contributions to the project yeah that's that's one thing i've i've, I've uh, given up with the traditional marketing channels a long time ago because it's not efficient and it doesn't work with bitcoin however what does work is bitcoin twitter so basically the only marketing we do is the twitter and then we have the affiliate program i m mentioned earlier so those are the only only marketing that we do at all and I don't think we we're going to need any any more than that. You know, just the the word of mouth is the best, and you know the affiliates have all the incentives to share their links uh, that link to our shop. And I, I think that's going to be like the kind of guerrilla marketing um, that we're going to be doing. And 
I mean, so to both points, right? The the Twitter account, for one, it's it's not an anonymous thing, right? It's it's a pseudonymous long term identity, which may or may not be yours, right? So here already, if if you would use an an established identity, maybe even the government cho given one, right? That would turn into a, uh, a, like that again is a it helps you to it maybe helps you to advertise and. Uh, gives that perceived level of trust and and already gained reputation from the past, right? So it might help you to speak to a larger audience, uh, e even on that medium such as Twitter, right? And but again, it doesn't have to be any previously used identity, and you can build a reputation from scratch. Um, but still, you do leave that reputation. Um, where I think it's really interesting is the affiliation model, right? Because this is a way of advertisement that can, in theory, be very anonymous, um, mainly because, well, all it requires is is a cryptographic token and a link, right? There is there is no inherent need to connect any formal identity to that affiliation system, at least not on a technical level, um, and that of course improves the privacy a lot. Uh, but on the other hand the the guy who has the affiliate link still has to publicly advertise it and talk to others so that they click the link and end up buying the book right so at some point someone has to reveal this link and there again we're having struggles with privacy because this is a, a probably a public announcement or at least an announcement to some selected few individuals but again interesting here it's not just one entity doing these announcements it's a decentralized starfish organization of multiple nodes, all in their own nuance and style, um, sharing this information. And then again, even when they are not anonymous and can be censored, at least there are numerous of them out there, so that if partial censorship occurs, at least the other part of the organization is still alive and running. Right, yeah, and, and we do have, um, you know, people working on, under uh pseudonym and and also with their own face and, and name and basically what I, I would say it's kind of like uh, uh you know you can opt out of the privacy but the privacy is default so all you all you need at the moment is, is a, a throwaway email to register for the for the affiliate program and we use that contact to make the payments and in the future uh, you can do that by, by yourself from, from the site uh, so then from there, where, where you go from there, it's, it's all you, like how, how you want to send your, how, how you want to share your link. Um, you know, if you want to connect what, what social media accounts are you going to connect on it or, or what, what is your style? It's completely up, up to you. So uh, again, you know, kind of shifting the responsibility to the actor where where it where it actually belongs and and I don't want to gather anybody's data like sure if you want to give it to me you know I'm I'm not going to like you can give it to me but I'm going to be deleting it from my from my computer as soon as I get it uh, the the point is here um, like for example if you look at our terms of service uh, you know all all the um, if you order a book from us uh, within thirty days we will we will uh, uh, nuke your information so it won't be stored. So if you have an issue with an order, you will have to let us know uh, the ex ex exact order number and, um, you know, perhaps the date, probably the order number is enough uh, so we can help you with that. So we don't store any information at all. Uh, the only exception is whatever you put in in the, uh, the affiliate program, which is also explained in the terms. Uh, so if you choose to put, like, let's say you want to put your website there to let us know that you have a website and, and you know, what you're doing there and share that information, you can, but you don't have to. All, all you have to do is provide an email address uh, as of now, and maybe in the future, just, uh, just a username or uh, uh, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, lightning link or uh, whatever we can use to ident identify you. This is another fascinating point uh, because I think this is somewhat of a contradict or a conflict between full user sovereignty and privacy optimal solution. Um, and this is nicely explained in the paper, Anonymity Loves Company, I think back in the 1980s or 90s, or it's, it's pretty old in any case. But basically what they say here is that ultimately someone needs to make the decision that affects privacy. And it can be anyone in the production stage 
of the software or of the protocol all the way down to the end user. So it can be, you know, the, the cryptographers that come up with their, with the individual building block, right? That can be protecting user privacy, or it can be the software, the software architect, right? Designing the, the structure of, of the system so that it is private by default, right? Or it can be the person who implements the software of the previously specified protocol. Right? And that person can make decisions on privacy and, and which trade-offs to choose. Or then ultimately, uh, it ends up being the user, right? Who, who uses the software. He makes the decisions that either protect or compromise his privacy. And of course, the further down the choice, uh, the, the ultimate decision-making power gets pushed, the more sovereign each of the participants is, right? Because they get to make the decision. But the downside is that this provides a potential splintering um, because that's who, whoever makes that point of decision uh, will leave a fingerprint. And the later that fingerprint is left, the more fragmented is the actual taint of, of the set of people that we're trying to analyze here, right? So if even on the cryptography layer, everything is perfectly private by default, then it does not matter how at the very end of the chain, the user ends up using the software, right? Because the privacy decision was made all the way up at the front, right? So there's no fingerprint in between any user. While compared, if the decision is shifted all the way down to the very end, to the end user, that would mean that he gets to make the decision and therefore different users will decide differently and have a different privacy fingerprint. Um, potentially de-anonymizing them. Um, so this is such an interesting trade-off between leaving each participant the freedom to choose and to decide, especially in the terms of privacy, but then inherently having the downsides of a splintered anonymity set if the decision gets made very late in the chain. Yeah, I, it's just, I didn't think of it that that much. Like that's a, that's a lot to process, but you know, for me, it's, I, I couldn't have, I don't think I could have implemented in any different way because I want to preserve the uh, free will of each and every user so they can do whatever they want with their data. And I just, you know, concerned about myself. I don't want to have uh, any kind of a list on, on my computer. So the only logical thing to do then is to keep as um, the minimal amount of information I need uh, to service people and then dispose of them as soon as possible. And since I cannot have any control over end users or affiliates or anybody else who is in the project, why would I even try? Like, I, I don't, you know, I can't control that. So what I can control is the data that I store and that's it. And I think that's, that applies to everybody. Yes. And, and so in this context, right, you are the software architect. Uh, kind of designing the organism as well as the the executor right that the one who actually runs the server um, and you can make decisions to favor privacy of the end user and when you do that like for example deleting the data then the user doesn't need to worry about it or regardless of how the user chooses or how the user acts his data will be deleted in, in 30 days right so his action no longer directly affects his privacy on on that level of analysis and but what I'm basically saying is that you've you've already gone really like you've already done a, a good amount of work to get it into the state where little information is required, right? And a lot of power is is there for for the user, and that was already difficult enough, right? But now the the next level would be to use some, for example, you know, some some fancy advanced cryptography that gives you the same set of of flexibility and, and usage, maybe even more, but without compromising on, on privacy, because even you as the system architect can know and the, the, the executor of the system, right? The, the server that runs the whole thing, even you cannot, even you, even because the data is protected on with cryptography, regardless of how the server acts, even if he is malicious, the privacy and therefore the censorship resistant of the contributors are, are not affected. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, you know, I am the central point of failure and I only have my word to give, you know, you don't know actually if I'm keeping a name list, uh, you, you just have to take my word for it now. And, you know, the same goes for any supplier who touches your package that has your possibly has your name. If you chose to put it, include it, 
um, I can't give you any guarantee that they don't keep a list either. So yeah, I see, I see your point and that, yeah, that would be in, indeed something, uh, a big problem to solve. I just have no idea how to even approach that. Yeah. So I find it interesting that, that you're basically building a distributed distribution system <laughs> for, for passing on information and, and patterns. And that's of course easy in cyberspace, or there are many ways of doing that, but how about in meat space? Like what are some trade-offs to consider here to make that actually work? Yeah, it's a tricky one because, um, you know, the, usually the most affordable way to deliver books is the so-called snail mail, uh, the, the state is mail, and uh, it's not very efficient, but the, you know, uh, other companies, shipping companies such as FedEx or other uh, kind of like spider distribution companies uh, can be quite expensive and even prohibitively expensive. Sure, I can offer it as a premium service, but most people would like to opt for the low time preference option, which will be the snail mail and which brings me back to the original problem. But uh, yeah, I wanted to bring out that, you know, I've been living in China for a while and, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting how, how you know, it's kind of like a communist country and at least that's the per perception for most people. But there's some elements that I really are, I'm fascinated by, like, for example, the distribution system, like the mailing system, there's no, like, I, I think there is like a, a state mail, uh, of course, uh, too, but, almost nobody uses it. Like if you order something online, um, it will be most likely picked up uh, by a sovereign um, entrepreneur on a, on a tuk-tuk or a motorbike and a, and a smartphone. And, and they will come to your door. They will take the thing that you want to send. They will wrap it up for you and they will deliver it uh, through their own network. And they scan a QR code with the, with the phone and you can actually follow the parcel everywhere. And it goes through this like really distributed network of really just people who are working, like working people, like single people, they don't, they don't have companies. Maybe some of them do, but most of them are just single operators with a, with a motorbike and a, a will to make money. And, and this is, you know, by the way, you know, China is more capitalist than socialist in my opinion. I, th I think a lot of, lot of like uh, European countries are way more socialist in that regard, at least in business sense, like the, you know, Chinese people don't spit on the businessman's face, like, like they do in the, in the Europe. So it actually, it, it is easy to start making money there. And this is one example. And, and, you know, I, I just wonder, you know, this probably in Europe, you, you need all kinds of licenses. You need a permission. You need to ask permission to do these kind of things because, you know, oh, it's, it's mail and it's deliveries and it's, uh, whatever, like it is not super easy in my experience to penetrate the market. Like it is in, in, in China, like anybody with a motorbike can, can just join in, download an app and start delivering packages to anybody. Um, so I, I think I, I would like to see something like that. If somebody's working on something like that, you know, definitely let me know. And you know, this is so similar to how Uber started out, right? With this reckless permissionless system of just people who want to drive other people around being a like, being given a, a tool to communicate with their potential customers, so to say, right? But again, because the software architecture of that app was inherently centralized, uh, it's probably not fulfilling its potential. Uh, and we see how it's being choked down by state regulation in, in many, many countries. So to somehow, again, have a decentralized, censorship-resistant, anonymous network for not just personal travel, but also for tra uh, uh, movement or, or shipment of goods um, would be really interesting. And the, the difference that you're explaining here is, is not because, you know, Uber is the human drives from the destination to the, uh, sorry, from the source to the destination with the same driver. What you're now proposing is to use a decentralized system, not just for delivering point A to B, but for routing a payment via different uh, couriers so that it kind of can reach any destination uh, with, without, well, without needing one person to bring it all the way, which has benefits also in terms of privacy, right? Because you can actually construct an onion route here so that any one hop does not does not know who the source and the destination is. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of like lightning network, you know, like you have these hops, uh, that, that you can also choose to follow, um, 
you know, online because you want to track your parcel and it's included in the system because everybody is running the same software, right? And this, this also opens up another opportunity for existing entrepreneurs like shopkeepers, which in China, there are plenty, like everybody, every corner, there's a shop. So you will always find somebody who is willing to make a little bit extra on the side and, and double as a, as a parcel point. So you can just go there, pick up your parcel, and uh, you don't even have to have it delivered to, uh, directly to your address. You can just choose these uh, you know, drop-off points, which is also uh, some, something of a privacy improvement. Now, of course, let's not go into the fact that probably all these apps are somehow under the control of Chinese government. Uh, but, you know, that's besides the point. The model is, you know, sound, I think. And, and, and it can be, I think it should, you know, it can be uh, probably done uh, even better. And it can be done uh, with privacy in mind. And, you know, think about this, like you, you're having like a, your ice cream shop that, uh somewhere in north where where half of the year yeah, you can't even keep it open but then you could just open it up as a parcel spot for for the time that you can't sell ice cream or at least you don't sell that much uh, you will have that option and you will just list on the app your location and you know um, anybody can have parcels sent to your location and then they can just come and uh, they can show a code from their phone or paper and they can pick up their parcel and that's it. No ID needed. Like that's, that's also something that blew me away. Like you don't need, ever need to show an ID when you pick up a parcel in China. Like you just have the code that, uh, you know, you, you get with the, from the, from the shipper. I, I, I thought that was like mind blowing to me because it's, it's, you know, I, I always thought that you would be so much more followed or, you know, taps would be kept on you in, in China. But actually the fact I think it is that there's just simply too many people there. Yeah, you, you cannot, like that kind of a system, it's gotta be distributed. It's gotta be, uh, you know, like uh, single entrepreneurs, like for example, food there, like everything is basically local food because there's no possibility. Like in Finland, we wrote everything through central warehouse, which means that the animal you buy from the supermarket has been dead like 24 to 48 hours at least before it reaches your plate. Uh, not so in China because uh, you don't have a chance to route like uh, millions of people's food through a central point of failure, but you have to have a distributed system. I think that's very interesting. And I think that's like any sufficiently big society will have to go to that kind of like, you know, emerging order from chaos. Yeah, that's very interesting. But I, I, I guess one additional point towards that direction is that once you've lived through a communist uh, regimes and the inherent price uh, meddling and meddling with the economy in general, and once you've been at a level of starvation, uh, as has been the case in any communist economy, uh, well, I, I guess you you understand the principles of self-sovereignty and self-sufficiency, especially in terms of food provision. And that does emerge a, a tendency to decentralize and localize uh, food production, right? It, even like it can go as extreme to you growing and butchering uh, your own animals, uh, or of course be more splintered apart, uh, you know, to buy it at a local butcher store compared to the central warehouse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, like people people learn and people take notice and. And you, you will, if you go to China, you will notice that immediately, like it's, it's really a dog eat dog world. Like you, you, you know, people are really holding their own, like you don't really mess with them or you don't definitely, you don't mess with their livelihood. That, that's for sure. And I think even the, you know, the communist party knows that you, you just like, they don't really, uh, for example, tax small entrepreneurs, they go for the big fish. So if you, if you just want to sell like, you know, hot potatoes in the street corner, by all means do so just you know don't bother anybody don't don't talk anything bad about the government or uh, silly stuff like that if you just want to make money for yourself and your family go nuts now that's what i like about china <laughs> yeah just a bit uh, difficult for us to not talk bad about the state <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there, there's no perfect like state is always uh the inoptimal solution to any problem like free market can provide anything better and it's just a fact. And that's, uh, that has necessarily not been always true. Like why did, you know, if, uh, you know, I read the sovereign individual and I recommend that book, um, you know, it, it hasn't always been the case that act sometimes the state, there was a time the state possibly provided a service that was worth it. Like 
you know, monopolizing the violence, keeping you safe from bandits and, you know, wildlife or whatnot, uh, maybe building some roads. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there was something there, but certainly not anymore in the information age where we have internet, we have 3D printers, we have Bitcoin crying out loud. So we can absolutely 100% sure provide every single service that the state pretends that they provide for us better, cheaper, faster, more reliant, more sovereign, in every single way better. And if the states don't start to, you know, treat the people less like cattle and more like customers, they're just going to wither away, which I'm personally eager to see. Pierce, you heard it here first. This is why free individuals win. Well, thank you very much, Nico, for, for coming on, on the show. This was, again, a phenomenal conversation. Uh, it's, it's always very surprising and inspiring to talk to you. It's, it's always new ideas that emerge out of the rabbit holes we go down to together. Uh, so that's, uh, that's really lovely. Uh, Piers, if, again, if you want to hear more of Nico, there are way too many hours of us both talking. <laughs> so if you don't yet have enough, uh, there is more <laughs> on other channels. Yeah, likewise, Max. It's always a pleasure. Thank, thank you for your thoughts and your ideas. And uh, I sure learned a lot, like I always do when I talk to you. And it's a pleasure and it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you as a friend. Yeah, yeah, likewise. So again, Piers, decentralized systems have no single point of failure. Decision-making powers is, is distributed to multiple people. Patterns are shared across a network of nodes so that if one node goes down, others still have that, uh, that information and that pattern and can apply it again. And then if you can then further combine that with incentivizing low time preference people to come into uh, your organization by not structuring it as an employee based contract, but as a capitalist uh, um, entrepreneur type contract so that people get paid after they've provided meaningful work that has been purchased by the customer. Right, the very the actual value creation happens, uh, and this system is not just working great for for Nico in his publishing house for translating and publishing numerous great Bitcoin resources. I believe that this philosophy of organization is essentially critical in building secure and censorship resistant Bitcoin privacy weapons. Uh, I I don't believe that in the long run centralized service providers have a a reasonable chance to survive in the most optimal freedom conditions uh, as they in inherently can get compromised. And once they do, well, everything is over. There's, there's no alternative. Uh, so having a unstoppable, uncensorable, uh, unconfiscatable um, methods for organizing, not just on a monetary level, but for any venture whatsoever uh, is, is key. And I think will is that will be established with the continuous creation of free software tools that make these protocols easier, uh, cheaper, and more reliable. And these concepts do not just have to be uh, envisioned on the deep cryptography or on the system architecture or in the software implementation, but, but also on the user level. Uh, so there is, to sum it up, a whole bunch of work still to do, to fletch out this, this concept and to apply it in life. But I do believe it's built on a solid foundation and that with these strategies, we can actually manifest tools for sovereign individuals that are there when people really need them. Uh, and that is ultimately very useful. So one more time. Thanks, Piers, for listening to the show and tossing some sats. And thanks, Nico, for coming on today. Thank you.